All right, it's seven oh two. Why don't we uh, Why don't we go ahead and get started? So, um, welcome everyone to our first virtual tasting with Master Sommelier uh, Andy Myers. Um, say hi to Andy. Uh, Hello. First, first, you know, um, my name is Jake Whitman. Uh, I'm the founder of Really Good Box Wine. Um, I don't know. I know some of you on who are on this this webinar, but uh, not everybody. So it's it's nice to meet you. Um, I am so excited for you all to be here to get to know Andy. Um, this should, if you know Andy, this should be a really fun hour. He's full of stories. And uh, if you were, if you were joined, if, if you joined a few minutes early, I know some of you joined a few minutes early and heard some of the the back and forth. Um, you can tell he has he has moved to Hawaii and uh, is living living the dream. So um, yeah, that's not a virtual background. Yeah, that's, that's a all, real that's all real, real background. <laughs> so um, you know whether you, if some of you are going to be tasting along with Andy, um, some of you don't yet have the wine or maybe drank through the wine, which I asked Andy not not to do. I thought that was the one concern I had was that Andy was going to finish his wine before we got <laughs> to this tasting. So uh, hopefully those of you who do have the wine um, have also saved just enough to do. Jake, so just to prove that I didn't just put red wine in a glass, I did, actually, I did actually say it. Perfect. Perfect. Um, all right. So before we get started, you know, um, just a quick kind of background, you know, we, we, we started really good box, box wine with one mission in mind, right? We want to significantly elevate the quality um, of wine in the box wine format. Um, some of you on here know a little bit more about the journey that we're on than others, but we are still pretty early in this, in this mission. Um, and meaning that all of you who are on this call are some of the earliest people to, to try our wine. Um, this is our, this Cabernet Sauvignon is the second release that we've done. We have a couple more coming out that we'll talk about. Andy has had had the chance to try these um, and aside from me and a couple other people, nobody else had. So I'm really excited to bring those to the world. Um, and so just choosing what wine you drink is serious business. It's an important decision. So thank you for, for trusting us with, uh, with, with that decision. So a couple of quick housekeeping things um, down below in the chat you'll, or down below in the Zoom, you'll see both a Q and A and a chat. The last 20 minutes or so will be kind of a discussion Q and A um, that we'll have. And so if you do have questions and a couple of you have already started putting questions in the chat, um, feel free to leave questions in there. You can leave it during the actual tasting portion if you want us to kind of talk about that um, or leave it for the Q&A um, for after the tasting. And we'll try to get to, to all the questions that all of you have. Um, at the end of this call, we will have a, a code for 10% off your next order if you're interested in buying. Um, and I know that some of you were invited by a friend who have, has tried the wine, um, but you haven't yet. And uh, if you did do that, we'll send you each a code for 15% off your next order. Um, and we'll likely do that if, if, as we do these, these tastings um, as we go. Um, and then finally, we are recording this. Uh, so if you do want to go back and watch this again, um, or if you want to send it on to somebody, uh, we'll send the link out afterwards. So with that, let me introduce Andy. Um, I want to give a quick sense of who Andy is and his personality. So uh, when we first started, first started kind of working to, working together, and he was kind of coming on to, to to talk about the brand, I asked him to send me a bio, and I want to read the bio that he sent <laughs> me. <laughs> so, the bio that he sent me says, "Andy Myers has been in restaurants since he was 14 years old when he took a summer gig working banquets at the terrible country club. He found his love of wine while working at the three Michelin star inn at Little Washington and never looked back." He did a 10-year-long stint as sommelier at City Zen with Chef Eric Zebold in Washington, D.C., and was the beverage director for Chef Jose Andres Think Food Group for seven years. Currently, he's beginning his new life as wine director for the Kohaniki Club in Kona, Hawaii. I think I might have gotten that close. Really enough. close. Really close. Um, he's covered in tattoos, practices yoga, drinks all the Fernet Branca, listens to as much Buck Owens as he does Slayer, even though he's known as the metal sommelier. He spends all of his extra cash scuba diving any and everywhere he can, which now that he's in Hawaii gets has gotten easier to find and finds it funny when you call him a sommelier and is a freak for German Riesling. Oh yeah, he passed the master sommelier exam in May of 2014. If asked, he would tell you that the experience was awesome. We will talk about that a little bit. So oh. before we get into the tasting, um, Andy, you've always kind of struck me as someone who's kind of like beats to his own drum, isn't afraid to shake things up a bit. Can you just give a little more color and your background and how you got into wine? Yeah, I got into wine through punk rock. It was super easy. Um, you know, I've been playing around in restaurants for years because it was a pretty easy gig. 
uh, I ended up out of high school joining a band with some, some people who are still some of my very best friends in the world. Uh, we were all shocked and amazed that we didn't make it as rock stars. I'm still a little confused how that didn't happen. But um, in, between, uh, in between tours and records and all of that stuff, I continued working in restaurants. And the restaurant life is not a necessarily easy or fun life. But the best parts about it always seem to be focused around uh, selling wine, studying wine, talking about wine. Um, when I worked out at the inn, I had the good fortune to be around one of the greatest sellers in the world, which inspired me to start studying a little bit more. Um, in studying, I heard about these lunatics called master sommeliers, and I thought they were crazy. Uh, I went and took one of their one of their classes, and I thought this is insane. Who could who could ever do this? Who would ever want to do this? I don't I don't think this is necessarily something I can pull off. And I went and took their second uh, examination and passed it. And I thought I totally just got lucky, and I started studying a little bit more. And I went to the third exam, and I passed it. And I thought I definitely just got lucky. And then uh, all of a sudden I was invited to sit for the master's exam. And it only took me five more times and years to get over the hump with that. But yeah, it really was just, you know, when playing in bands, it was real easy to quit a restaurant job and go on tour. And then it was real easy to come back and get another one. And so I just, I fell in love with the industry and wine was just the most fun part of the industry. Um, and so you just kind of, you know, trying to still all the parts of restaurant life that aren't fun. And when you're done, if you're me, you end up as a sommelier. So yeah, it, it was a, it's been a heck of a journey. I never would have thought that the morning I walked into the cellar at the little Washington and asked the grumpy old French sommelier if I could apprentice, I never thought it would lead to me sitting here in paradise talking to you about wine. What, what was his, what was his response when you asked him, when you asked him that? He said what I would say to sommeliers for years after who would ask me if they could apprentice with me. Sure, sweep the floor. And he gave me a broom. There and then go. very quickly, he let me know how bad my French was, how uh, stupid I was, how much I had to learn, where I could pick up his dry cleaning and when. I never did that to my guys. But uh, yeah, he was just like, fine, sweep the floor, clean this up, do the inventory. So you start as a seller rat, you know, and being a sommelier is it's an admin job and a grunt job. And if you do those right, your reward is service. You're allowed to work the floor if you're good at keeping the numbers tight and the seller clean. Yeah. Love it. Great. Well, we'll have a chance to talk a lot more about that after the tasting, but uh, I know cool. people are on the East Coast. It's it's well into the evening. It, it's seven o'clock uh, on the West Coast. It's perfect time for a glass of wine. It's just after 4 p.m. And then Hawaii, it's and in Hawaii, it's two. It's two. <laughs> so, um, Andy, I'm going to turn it over to you to talk about the 2019 Cabernet Sauvignon and uh, and again, if you guys, if anyone who's in the chat has questions, uh, we can kind of, you know, we can kind of uh, jump in with the help answer those related to the re related to the wine, the tasting, or if it's more broad questions, we'll address them in the Q and A. Cool. Uh, yeah. So this is fun. I was really excited when you told me that uh, we were going to do a cab from Paso. Uh, it ties in weirdly when I came out to interview for the job here in Hawaii. Um, my my wife and I flew out on a Thursday. And we had to then take a red eye on Sunday to get to Paso because we were doing a, a thing called Paso Wine School. And um, it was like four days of immersion into the wineries and the wine regions uh, of Paso and all the little sub zones and whatnot there. And so we, we drank a bunch of wines at Paso while I was interviewing for this job, which was really kind of cool. And so when you said you were doing one of these, I was thrilled. Um, and one of the things that struck me when, when you and I started tasting your wines and started putting this together was the wines you're using are true to form. They, you know, and as you, you'll point out to folks, you know, always a single vintage, always a single varietal, um, always, you know, from one place. And so I expect them, when you and I first talked, I expected them to be what I would say correct. I expect them to taste like where they're from, taste like what the varietal is, all of those things. And I was immediately impressed because, um, I'm sorry, somebody wants you to put on your Hawaiian shirt. I'm all for that. I just saw that. I do have a Hawaiian shirt upstairs. I could. I have I extras. Could. I can mail them over to you. No yeah, yeah, yeah. For but, um, but so, yeah, so when we get to this one, so this is Paso Cap. So what did I, before even tasting it, what did I walk in expecting out of this wine? I expected ripe fruit. I expected a judicious use of oak. That's how you know I haven't had much to drink. That's one of my favorite uh, test phrases for people to see if they're drunk. Can you say judicious use of oak? 
and get through that phrase. Get through that. Um, yeah. We'll give it we'll but, give it another 20 minutes of tasting and then we'll yeah. come back to that one. Uh, but I, I expected the oak not to be heavy handed. I expected the fruit to be ripe. And uh Paso wines literally bring sunshine to me. Uh, because there there is that, you know, while they have this beautiful diurnal shift, so I'm also expecting polite acid in the wines. Uh, I am expecting that warmth, that sunshine, that restorative uh, style of cap, which is exactly what this is bringing, which is super cool. I'm going to take another sip because I can. I'll, I'll sip with you. I appreciate that. I don't like to drink alone. I mean, I'll do it. but um, So in this case, it's got all that cap stuff, current, cassis. The, the fruits are juicy. They're ripe. They're very full. But what this isn't is like 94. I didn't even check the alcohol level on it, but it's not egregious at all. I mean, it's it's a bigger style wine, but it's cab. I expect that. The tannins are there. They're doing what tannins are supposed to do in a Cabernet. And I, when I do this, it's the opposite of how I look right now. Cabernet tannins are like they're a, a polished banker. You know, they stand up straight and they're very, they're very good. Son, you should really think about your future. I've got one word for you, and it's plastics. You know, um, and cab tannins do that, which you have here. They're right down that front palate, standing up straight. Without it, this wine would have gone off the rails because it, because of all that juicy fruit, because of that nice, rich ripeness to it. Without those tannins, this would just be, you know, a big like turleys in. Um, oh, I'm not allowed to talk smack about other people, am I? Um, I'll try to avoid that. It would just be a big fruit bomby. Um, you know, there, there would be nothing to this other than alcohol and fruit if it didn't have that structure and those tannins to it. So for me, this is definitely, um, I mentioned to you earlier, I've been putting it in the fridge out here because I'm not drinking a lot of uh, big reds these days. Uh, I did like it with a little bit of a chill on it. Um, I just thought it actually it, it brought the wine into this like nice comfort, comfort zone. And then halfway into the glass sitting here, it comes up to temp anyway. Um, so yeah, juicy fruit. Nice, uh, nice little kick of alcohol to it. Good tannins, good structure. What's not to like, man? I love it. Talk yeah. a little bit about um, for those of so they're probably even though it feels like we're drinking alone. I think that there's a number of people drinking drinking along with us. So can you talk a little bit about you know as you as you start and you uh, what did what you get on the nose and kind of as you take your taste oh, your sure. first yeah, yeah. front end to the back yeah. end and just kind of walk through. Um, what people might be feeling as they're as they're drinking this so yeah so the first thing i do uh is first i just i just look at a wine because it's pretty uh next thing is i go give it a little swirl if anybody doesn't know this stuff there's people out here who know stuff and are, are wine geeks and there's people who aren't so for anybody who isn't um when you swirl you actually release some of the esters and so you you lift the aromas of the wine a bit um i jake i don't know if i've done this trick with you but uh, i love doing this when i'm tasting wines with people I encourage everybody when you do the little swirly swirly thing, and then you're going to go put your nose in it and sniff it, take your eyes and look down. Most of us are comfortable looking down to the left. So do that for a minute. And then take the glass away. And then this is the fun one. I want you to do the same thing, but roll your eyes to the ceiling and try and smell the wine. And you almost can't smell anything. Yeah. So when you're smelling a wine, look down. There's a whole long story behind why I'll skip that for now, but it's super cool. So anyway, and, and little sniffs. You get nothing by going, nothing. Uh, it is also- Look for uh, it, except I, look cool doing it. Oh yeah. And I roll pinky out, speaking of cool, you know, because that's I'm, I'm classy like that with a K, classy K. So, um, but yeah, so you take a small sniff. And this, the first thing I get is actually, there's a little bit of oak on this. There's a little vanilla floating on the top of it. Ripe black cherries. There's a cool little like uh, leather note that just popped into it. That, I like that, like sort of a like good worn leather. Yeah, I like that because I, I like earthiness. I like some stank in my wines. Um, and then those fruits come through. It's that currant, cherry, cassis, but they're all really ripe. Um, and ripe, like think about your fruits like that, almost like Chambord liqueur. You know, they're coming through ripe in that way where they've got a, a nice big note to them. There's a yeah, again, I'm getting that vanilla's coming through again. So it's telling me, I don't, you didn't tell me how much oats on this, but there's a little bit. Um, a little bit. Yeah, about but it's 20, not. It's 25%. 25% of oats. Yeah, it's not screaming, but it's nice. It's a, it's a component of a wine, not the feature of the wine. And that, that's something I like, you know. After that, again, we get into a little bit of earthiness, almost a little like mushroom and leather and tobacco and tar, all cool. After I've smelled the wine a bit and kind of gone through my little grid, and I, 
I didn't say things that aren't there, but I go through my own process. Like I look for floral notes. There's really nothing floral here. Um, I look for herbs. Eh, not so much. I look for spices and that's that oak, like the vanilla, clove, cinnamon, that's happening in there. Uh, I look at the fruits, I look for oak. After that, I go on to the fun part, which is drinking the wine. Swirl it around a bit, take some oxygen in, sit with it for a second, let it happen. And there, what's interesting, those tannins took all that. I was talking about like liqueur fruit, but here the fruit gets dustier and a little bit, it's still very ripe. I mean, you still get that this is a ripe, fresh, you know, bowl of fruit you just uh, put in your mouth, but you get all that dust on top of it. So now it's a little more like, kind of like, uh, uh, ground up chalk you can feel if you run your tongue over the roof of your mouth there's a dryness up there that's again what's playing again yeah, that's what's holding this wine together that's what's giving it its structure and something more than just fruit and alcohol to talk about so that's cool i like that Great. um and all that other stuff we talked about the baking spices it's there the vanilla nutmeg clove cinnamon all of those things are happening on the palate the fruits yep the fruits stay right there's that dust to them the oak's coming through nicely I am getting a little bit of herb on this now. It is like a little, like, it's falling in with that leather and tobacco. So it's almost like sage. Think of, I'll say dirty herb, but you know, an herb that's a little more earthy in style. So I usually go to sage and rosemary or stuff like that. So this has a savory note to it, but I dig. That's very cool. Yeah. And then, uh, you know, the, the we tend to assess alcohol as, as warmth, as heat that rolls through, uh, uh, through your esophagus and down. And yeah, I mean, this has some booze on it. Uh, cause I feel it's warm getting down almost to my belly button. So that's, uh, that's telling me it's got some probably 14, five on it. Um, right on, yeah. right on the nose. 14, I can, five. Get, I can get down with this wine, man. Um, I need a burger. I want a burger with this wine. Yeah. It's I a good get fancy and like order a nice cab or something or a nice steak or something, but this is a, like, give me a good, good greasy cheeseburger and this wine's going to kill it. Yeah. yeah. I love it. We, we have, uh, we have a we do have a request for the long story of looking down the smell. We'll get to the so there's a couple other questions in here, but since we're on it, the long story of sure. looking down the smell the wine. Um, so as I understand it, when we were like plain dwelling monkeys, the things that could kill us came at us from the horizon down. Okay, so when you are taking in new information, when you need to process information, particularly sensory, physical sensory information, the smells of things that could be hiding out in the grass, um, things of that nature. You look down because that's where you're looking to take in. If I ask you, all right, uh, what did you do two Friday nights ago? You will inevitably look up and to the left or the right, but you'll go, um, oh yeah, that's not, okay. Okay, yeah, we, we went to the movies that night, but first we stopped at our friend's house and we had a drink. So when you're looking for information that you know, cognitive functions, you look up. When you need to bring information in, you look down. It's just apparently how we're hardwired. So to look up shuts off the part of your brain that brings in new information. So when you're looking up, your brain goes into, I'm trying to find something I already know mode, rather than I'm trying to bring something new in. So your, your nose just shuts down. It does, it's not needed at that point. Yeah, I know. When I learned that, I was just like, ah. it's definitely true. I mean, yeah, it's I look so like, weird. When I look up, I can't. That's that's true. Yep. So that's as I understand it. That's the story. And even if it's not, I'm sticking to it. Stick to it. It sounds yeah. good. And it sounds right. Yeah, and it, it's also it's your new party trick. That's right. I expect everybody to win a couple of free drinks at a bar doing that. So. Nice. Um. Cool. Well, let's let's talk a little bit about um the the uh, the other two varietals i mean we don't have them in front of us to taste and yeah. nobody nobody here uh has has tried it except for except for you and me um yeah. but they're coming soon and and so so one of the questions in the q a is what varietals can we expect next and when so let me i can answer that question really quickly and then andy you can talk a little bit yeah. about them. um so we are doing a 2021 um pinot noir rosé from the russian river valley it's actually the same um, vineyard, Ketchum, Ketchum Vineyard. 
that we made the 2020 Pinot Noir that we launched uh, and released in August of last year, and then in November again on both unlimited releases. So those those are sold out for now, but um, the Ketchums are good friends of ours, and and we went back and said, hey, let's let's make a rosé together. They make a rosé already that's absolutely phenomenal, and we decided to um, source our own grapes and actually produce it under the really good box wine um, brand and under you know under our under our label. Um, rather than sourcing it from, from another producer. And, and um, our winemaker, his name is Tammy, um, Tammy, and she is a phenomenal winemaker and, and, uh, and, and has made this wine. So that's, that's coming in about uh, two weeks or so. We're, we're finalizing production right now, and, and, and we're hoping to, to start shipping that the third week of, the third week of March. So um, that's coming very soon. And then following immediately on its heels is a 2021 uh, Sauvignon Blanc from the Russian River Valley. It's from 75% of the grapes are sourced from the Dry Creek Valley, 25% are sourced from Alexander Valley. So it's all Sonoma, um, Sonoma Valley wine. Um, and again, we, we source those grapes and produce those and Tammy, Tammy made that wine as well. So those are the next two varietals. We're, we're now talking about to, to some other producers about what's coming after that. And so we don't have that kind of firmly set and, and finalized and announced, but um, we are looking at some um, some really interesting and, and interesting wines from from great producers, both within California and outside and outside California. So, Andy, you have tried the rosé and the yeah. Sauvignon Blanc. Can you talk a little bit about them? I remember the first thing I said to you when I tried the Sauvignon Blanc was because I was surprised being a California Sauvignon Blanc. I said, "Oh, this actually tastes like Sauvignon Blanc." Uh, and so many producers in California just go out of their way to make it not taste like Sauvignon Blanc. Uh, you know, they'll cut some semillon into it. They'll cut Viognier into it. Why anyone would cut Viognier into anything? Um, but they kind of go out of their way to lose that grassiness, lose that that high acid. They'll throw oak at it to round it off a little bit. And to me, the magic of Sauvignon Blanc is that like bright, zippy acidity, that zing, that crisp note to it, that grapefruit, uh, the little grassy notes to it as well. And this this had that. It was cool climate Sauvignon. The acid was up on it. It was bright and fresh. That's actually the one I'm looking forward to the most because I will crush that wine out here. That's like, that's all day, all day drinking wine and wine. Um, and yeah, so that was my, my favorite thing about that is it was, you know, and I said to you again, I, I brought it up with the cab, I'm bringing it up here. Um, I'm looking for correct in wines. Does it taste like it's supposed to taste? And that's the thing I really enjoyed about the Sauvignon Blanc. It tasted like Sauvignon Blanc not like California white wine. Mm -hmm. So that, that one I'm really stoked about. Uh, the Pinot Noir, similar uh, in that you managed uh, to keep the, the Pinot itself had a good restraint level to it. And it was the first of your wines that I tasted. So, and that was kind of the wine that I thought, okay, I think I can, I think I can do this. I think I can be a part of this because you, you made a very nice wine there and we'll get into other reasons I love the company. But um, so what I found on the Rosé it actually had restraint to it. Um, you're seeing too many rosés these days where they're just throwing, to me, they're, they're almost sugary. Uh, they're getting too big. I think a lot of people forgot. You know, it's fun to say rosé all day, uh, but I think people forgot what rosé is. Um, and it's supposed to be light, quaffable, you know, for the most part, afternoon wine to sip on sitting here. <laughs> but, uh, but it, you know, it's supposed to be a light, fun, easy wine and you have too many people now trying to make you know serious rosé okay I, I just don't get it and so i thought your rosé it's a very good wine but it does what it's supposed to do it's refreshing it's quaffable it's rosé don't overthink it and you didn't overthink it so good job good yeah, hurry up and get me some of that. I'm, I'm I know. To get there uh, it, it'll be on its way. Don't worry. It's it's okay. perfect suited for 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 that background there. Excellent. Perfect. Um, okay. Anything else on on the wines? Uh, we can jump into some of the kind of discussion and Q and A. Unless you have anything else you want yeah, to I think share. Going to, I mean, you know, the, the main things for me, and you know, I like the wines. I keep using that correct, true to form statement. I, I like that about the wines. I also you know, fell in love with the idea of the packaging of this, uh, particularly, you know, I, 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 don't, I don't even hear my friends back there. We can, we can. They want some too. Of Those course. are called Franklin's. Fellas. 
settle down. Sorry. <laughs> They're some of my favorite birds here. But, um, but, you know, living on an island where uh, you, recycling everything is important, uh, reusing things is incredibly important, not generating unnecessary waste. I do love the box concept. Uh, the wines are staying fresh. And also I crush the box, but I crush the box, but, but I crush the box. And then I could put that into the recycling bin rather than adding even more, um, um, rather than adding even more garbage to, you know, a closed ecosystem here. So yeah. that's another thing I just think is, I love what you're doing on that because for too long, you know, like when I was coming up as a sommelier, uh, screw caps were considered terrible. You know, oh, screw cap. And then it was, you can't have good wine in a box. So I like, I like that we're reimagining and remaking this. Yeah, I love it. Yeah, and you know, that was one of the first things that we talked about when we first started talking is you were like, I yeah. love the concept. You're like, I want to try the wine. I was like, perfect, let me send you a yeah. box. But, um, but can, you, can you talk a little bit about just that first, like you got the box, you tried it. What, what, what do you think of, like, what do you think about it? Like before you tried it, were you expecting it to be great wine? Like, can you talk a little bit about just kind of- Yeah, the I mean, I, I'd had, you know, I'd had my share of Boda boxes. Uh, you know, I may be a master sommelier, but I'm not rich. <laughs> so I'd had my share of, uh, of wines and boxes and usually they're bleh. You know, they, they taste vaguely of wine. I used to joke, I like any box wine so long as you add some gin to it. You know, that was like, that was the move, like the Boda box, Sauv Blanc, a little gin. Oh, perfect cuvee. Um, so I was like, I don't know what I'm going to get here. Is this just Boda box with good packaging? Is this, you know, fill in the other box wine that just looks cooler? I don't know. Um, you know, you and I had already had a nice uh, personal and professional connection. Like we hit it off already. So I thought this guy doesn't seem like an idiot. Um, he seems like a good dude. So I'm going to be really disappointed if this is bad wine because he just doesn't strike me as somebody who would do that. But here we go. So yeah, I went in like, I, I want this to be good. And, and it was, I mean, that was the thing. Um, you know, my, uh, my wife and I, uh, and I think, yes, I can actually see Chelsea is on the chat. Uh, Chelsea and I uh, opened it up and uh, she looked at me and was like, I would drink this. I drink a lot of this. And I was like, yeah, I would too. Yeah. So that was it. That's great. That's great. I think, I honestly, uh, I think I'm going to have to get some wine for the birds. Yeah. So they're they're asking for bit. it. Yeah. They're yeah. asking for it. Yeah. Um, I'll, we've got a couple questions in the chat. Uh, All right. So let's see. So also, I almost didn't have wine, any wine left for today. I'm glad you did. Uh, and I'm glad you kept some around. So, but, <laughs> But Dean, you are like the rest of us, where we we got through a lot of this box, and this box here is is close to empty as well. So uh, I hear it sounds like Andy's is Andy's is as well. Um, Actually, I'm doing pretty good on this one. I got a good little heft got some still. Heft, some heft still. Um, okay, and, then, a, and I'm I'm at one of the restaurants here, so the staff is all looking at me like, "When's it our turn?" Yeah, so, can we get in on that? Yeah. <laughs> Good. We'll share it around and let let, oh, uh, I will. I will. let me know what you think. Um, so there's a question about uh, about the Pinot, about post 2019 Pinot, um, American Pinot in particular, um, and and I can kind of answer the particular question about our Pinot, but then Andy would love your kind of thoughts on this. So you know, I was told by my wine cellar that wildfire wildfire smoke had compromised some vineyards by reducing the quality of the wines that they could manage to produce. Is that true? Um, so I can talk about the, you know, the 2020 Pinot that we made. Um, the grapes were actually pulled off right before the fires came, but the, but the vineyard did lose some grapes to, to smoke taint. Um, and, and the, you know, if you want to look, look up Ketchum, Ketchum Estate, they take extraordinary uh, care of their grapes. I think their quote, Ali, Ali, and the, the owner of, of Ketchum, Ali Ketchum and, and Renee, who they call their director of happiness, their, their kind of general manager, um, who I think may be on, may be on this, this call right now, um, talk about how, you know, they raise their kids on, on the land and they, they, they have a, they grow vegetables on the land and they're not going to, 
um, you know, put pesticides on or let smoke kind of destroy the destroy what they put out into the world. And so I do know that um, they they put a lot of care into making sure that the grapes that they pulled off the vines did not have smoke taint. Um, but unfortunately, a lot of producers are losing yeah. losing wine right now and losing grapes to, to smoke taint. Yeah, that, I mean that's just going to be an issue. Unfortunately, you're going to see lower amounts of wine out there from California over the next few years. Situations like this, I mean, the positive is it forces us as wine drinkers to find some other places and other avenues, but it also gives us the opportunity to, to support wineries and support that industry in California. I'm not saying go buy smoke tainted wine, but I'm saying, you know, the California winemakers are going to need some help. They're going to need some love. So I intend to keep buying wines and support them. I, all of a sudden, I feel like Jack Hanna, the like the animal guy from the, the old Letterman <laughs> shows and stuff. You're like Ace Ventura, pet detective. You just got your, you have your exactly. animals going around. You. <laughs> yep. um, that's great. Yeah, it is a. You're right. I mean, it is a. It is a challenge right now, and a lot of producers in California are are really feeling it, and it's uh, it's it's an existential threat, right? I mean, and this is part of the, you know, this there is a huge sustainability component with box wines. 68% um, of the carbon footprint of the wine industry comes from packaging and, and box wines have half the footprint as, as bottled wines. And so, you know, part of the existential threat that's kind of facing California right now is coming from, you know, is coming from climate change and there's more and more fires every year. And it's something that the industry is grappling with and feeling like it's not just a one-off problem that's happening, but is, it may continue, unfortunately, to be something that they have to grapple with year after year. Um, so, you know, it's, it's definitely changing the way the industry operates in a lot of ways. Um, well, I decided to start playing with the mute button to help out there. Sorry. Oh, there you go. <laughs> um, so anyway, so yes, but it is a challenge. Um, we take a lot of care not to get smoke tainted wine and as do most, you know, most higher end producers are, are looking are really careful about finding grapes that don't have smoke taint, but it's a it's definitely an issue. Um, so if not for long, hope, hope they have some good long. rainy weather out there soon. That's right. Um, what will the price points be for the new upcoming releases? Uh, they will, but they will also be $65. So there's four bottles of wine in each box, 1625 uh, equivalent price. We may look at other price points down the line, but for right now, this feels like the right sweet spot for the quality of wine that we're able to put into the, and the investment that we can put into the quality of the wine with giving a, a significant value versus what you would buy this wine for in a restaurant or sorry, in a grocery store or a wine store. Okay, uh, let's go back. We'll come back and, uh, and answer a couple more of these Q and A's. Um, but let me let me jump in with another question. So you know we've talked a little bit about packaging. You know this is a trend I think that's that's coming. Can these you know screw caps can't then then canned wines now box wines um, and there's some really interesting trends. What are some interesting trends you're seeing in the wine industry that are outside of packaging? Like what do you what are you interested in? What do you see in producers do that you think are cool? What are people doing that's cool these days? I've been I've been so interested in like how packaging has been moving with wines. Um, you're seeing a little bit more of grower, and it's more for me uh, grape growers uh, looking for alternative varietals as the world's becoming hotter. Uh, people are shifting into different little pockets to grow the you know the usual suspects, but then you're also seeing people uh, playing around a little bit with. You know, uh, Grunewald Leaners up in uh, uh, Oregon. Um, you're seeing folks in the Finger Lakes now playing with some more like uh, grapes from the Jura, more Gamays popping up in the United States. So I, I think it's interesting seeing how people are experimenting more. I mean, that's one of the fun things about American winemaking. There really aren't any rules. You know, outside of basically Napa Cab, there aren't rules. You know, you can do whatever you want. So more than anything, I, I've just been enjoying watching people try to break new grapes into the market. Um, that, that to me has been the most interesting to happen. What are, what are some of the, can you talk a little bit about the rules that California and um, some you know people who are on this call who are 
who are very wine knowledgeable and wine experts probably know a lot of these rules, but some people may not. Just we don't have to go in depth, but kind of the difference in the rules between American wine and European wine and, and other imported wines. Well, I mean, a lot of it, particularly if you want to play in Napa, is just the, the price of admission to buy a vineyard. And you have to make so much wine at a certain price point just to break even out there which you know so you kind of have to you have to make the wine that gets you the points if you want to sell enough wine to not go bankrupt or have to sell your whole your whole winery um so you know there just came a point where if you weren't getting 95 98 parker points you weren't going to be able to stay alive and so then everybody started making wine in a style to specifically fit one person's palate and then that person basically created what became you know, the europeans would tell you it's the american palette but it's not but it's the high-end collector palette and that palette drove napa cab napa cab prices napa shard um you know so that to me the the, the napa cab rules are you know you can't make wines you can but very few people can make wines in the way they were doing before 94 you know, very few people are making those like really cool Heights wines. Heights, of course, is still doing it, but, um, or Stony Hill or Chateau Montalena or, you know, or what, uh, what the Diamond Creek wines tasted like in the 80s, where these were like balanced wines, really focused, not massive fruit bombs, not over extracted, um, but that those don't fly anymore. It's not what people are asking about. Uh, whereas, in, you know, the European model was always, and even that's changed, you know, the, the, the critic who shall not be named, uh, you know, changed everybody in that way. But even, you know, originally in Bordeaux, it was, this is the way Latour makes wine. <laughs> End of story. And it stopped being Latour chasing, well, Latour didn't chase points. Latour made Latour. And then Latour started chasing points. But... So that's where I think the, the rules have, have uh, and I actually think those have gotten people into trouble now. I think you're seeing it, it's a lot harder to sell those $500 bottles of cash, yeah. you know, which brings us back to wine like this, which I think brings us to where in my heart wine should be, which is A, wine should be for everyone. Um, you know, don't get me wrong, you want to pop 90 Latour, I'll dance, but, um, but that's not everyday wine. And that took it to a place that, I think made wine no fun. It made it intimidating. Uh, it made it the, the price of entry for a, a young wine drinker just got too high, which is why I think you see a lot of folks, uh, particularly the younger generation now, drinking ciders, drinking craft beers, and turning to alternate formats, alternate packagings, cans of wine, boxes of wine, hard, uh, hard seltzers, things of that nature. You know, everybody still wants to get their buzz on, but nobody wants to feel stupid about it. Nobody wants to feel like they can't afford it either. Yeah, there so, is there's definitely an element of in certain parts of the wine industry that feel very unapproachable. And I think that's yeah. it's not it's, it's not good for the industry overall. And there's a certain time and place for it. But um, yeah. and I think critics, I think to some degree, winemakers, uh, I think to some degree, sommeliers, we did a bad job of making wine something for the people we did a great job of building that bubble and that hype i think it's time for sommeliers to bring it back to you know I, there was a there was a young sommelier recently who was studying and i said something about the the wine people de Pinay. and he's like why on earth would i want to know about that i thought you're never going to be the sommelier that i would hire mm -hmm. because i just thought you know that is a that's a people for me. Yeah. You know, it, it tastes like white wine. It's it's the Miller Lite of wine, but it's delicious. And it's yeah. like nine bucks a bottle. Why would I not drink people to that? Yeah. You know, and so that to me was, I want more of that. I want more of people coming back to wine because it's good. It's good for you. It makes you feel you know, like it makes life happier. So you don't yeah, forget all the big point wines. They're boring. Yeah, I hear you. Well, and the, you know, that is part of the, the exploration that we're on is sure will we maybe do a napa cab at some point for the right time and maybe yeah. but we're also doing a cab from paso robles or we're yeah. looking at more fun noma yeah yep. um so one of the questions and we got this one a lot and and we can kind of talk both talk about this so box wine 
typically 20, you talked about this earlier, right? Typically 20 bucks, 20 bucks a box or so. $19, I think is kind of what the industry has said is the sweet spot for, for box wine. Yeah. Um, this box, it's uh, 65 for four bottles of wine. So it's 1625 equivalent per bottle. Um, and the question is, is this a phenomenal value or is this really just a $16 and 20 or $20, 16 to $20 bottle of wine? And it's really not a value. Um, so would love your, you know, you've tried all the well, wines. I've done, I, so. I actually think it, I actually think it is a value. Um, and I think these wines hit well above the, you know, $16 a bottle mark. Um, and different ones in different ways. I think, you know, Cabernet, making a, a cab that tastes like this, you're looking at a $30, $40 bottle to make. Um, rosé, I think you're looking at, you know, $20, $25 a bottle. Um, and that's not to say the rosé is a lesser quality. I just think that's the sweet spot for buying something like that. Today. No, I think these actually offer a very good value. And I, excuse me, I think this is, uh, this is good wine at a very good price. And yeah, I mean, as, as we talked about, most of the boxes falling in that $20 category, they are not very good. Yeah, I, I had I, I had a conversation with someone uh, a couple months ago, and we were talking about this idea of, you know, is it can you put box, great, really, really high end wine into these different formats? And her thing was like, look, you can put if you can put good wine in a Tupperware and drink it with a straw, and it'd still be good wine. It might oxidize more quickly, but it's really about the quality of the wine rather than the format. It's just the producers have been using this format for lower end, lower end wines for a long time. Um, yeah, the, the, like, and that's the thing when I mentioned the the contra controversy of uh, screw caps back when those started becoming more prevalent. But it's just an enclosure. You're just keeping oxygen out of a product because you know wine is controlled spoilage. Um, you're just keeping spoilage out of a wine. You can put great wine, yeah, in anything. Hell, you should see what I usually drink out of at home. You know, it's like a coffee cup or a mason jar or a tea I'm cup. Um, I have a couple wine glasses at home it, it's funny um uh i've never met anybody who's better at uh, hunting thrift stores than my wife and so she inevitably buys us like you know 25 cent wine glasses because wow. i just break them i just i just break them i can't i just oops you know the cat bumps into them they break all the time um i've had the like i've got Celto glasses oh, great i just broke a 40 dollar glass instead of a two dollar glass yeah so yeah i'm drinking out of this right now because uh this is the restaurant <laughs> you know? but, glass. Uh, but no i think you know it's the same thing does a great wine glass enhance the experience of drinking wine yes um is there something about the, the ritual of opening a bottle of wine of particularly certain bottles bringing you back certain memories absolutely and i'm not saying stop drinking wine out of bottles and i'm not saying and, and even on my sort of not proletariat either. rant i'm not saying don't drink high-end wine no 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 there's time for all of it there's place for all of it so yeah. yeah putting wine in a box okay in a can okay you know in a bottle sure you can do any of these things and still have great wine going yeah. so yeah it's just you know the, the thing is you putting really good wine in a box you're just the first guy to do it you know so it's just it's weird right now because you're the first one to pull this off yeah you know, i think I'm, we're gonna I'm, see more there's some more coming i mean Atlas, Atlas creek you probably saw they just put out a 95 dollar box of their rosé yeah um, yep and there was a few years back the guys at domain monterius were doing they were doing a coteron village uh in box that was delicious and it was i was whole foods for that was like 45 50 back then for Cote de Rome. Um, I mean, you can put really good wine in. And yes, you are going to see more of this. And you're going to see more people realizing that the environmental impact of packaging matters more and more to people as we move forward. And again, you know, we talked a bit about folks younger than us. They care. Mm -hmm. You know, it's, it, they do care. This is a generation that came up where you do just recycle everything. It's weird. It's like our grandparents recycled everything. And, and, you know, these kids these days recycle everything. And then there's sort of the like us and our parents who are like, wait, is that, do I, can I put yogurt containers in there? I don't, right. you know, what number, so, what number on the bottom? Yeah. Yeah. So um, I think, I think that's going to become a bigger deal for people as we move forward. Yeah, I do too. And I think we're seeing it. I mean, canned wines are becoming 
are, are also more, they're a lot <clears throat> lighter and they're more portable and they're easier to recycle than glass and they're recycled. They're so much easier to drink when you're driving than having one of these. Cause I always, I spilled this one. Oh wait, that's not the endorsement you're looking for. Is it? <laughs> um, all right. The, all right, the last question I'll go from Q and A and then we'll come back to some and then we'll see if we can get to the rest from the end. Um, Andy, have you ever played slap the bag? Do you know slap the bag? I, I, there's like 900 things that just went through my brain and none of them can be what you're talking about. So I don't think so. so the, orig the way that most people, a lot of people have gotten started, had their first box point experience was in college, you play a game called slap the bag where you pull the bag out and it's as dumb as it sounds. You slap it and then you drink out of the spout and then you move on to the next person. There's really no point to it at all, but it's-, it's So no, I'm I've not done this. Okay. So the question is- all the is, dumb is shit I've done in my life, that's not one of them. Not, that's <laughs> not one. Um, it's a, it, is as, it is as silly and, and uh, has no point as it sounds, <laughs> but it's, awesome. it's a lot of fun. Um, it's definitely my first box wine experience back in. <laughs> um, so the question, one of the questions is, is it appropriate to slap the bag with this wine? I would like to say this one has a little bit more character and I would, I would treat it a little bit more delicately, but you know what, if you want to go slap the bag, you go for it. I'm not going to stop you. If, if, if that enhances your experience with this wine, then hell yeah. That's right. That's right. Awesome. Okay. Um, let's talk a little bit. Let's move away from the wine. I'd love to just kind of hear more about your, your background. Um, can you talk a little bit about what it was like working with Jose Andres? Yeah. Um, you know, working with Jose is an incredibly humbling experience because the, the motto of working for him is to change the world through the power of food. You know, and I remember coming on board and thinking, well, I just sling wine. What am I, what am I doing here? And meanwhile, you know, like I saw Jose's Instagram this morning. Dude is in Ukraine. Of course he's in Ukraine. Of course he's feeding people in Ukraine. Wow. You know, yeah, because Jose. Um, so working with him was incredibly inspiring and humbling uh, in that sense that the working the restaurant, sometimes you felt like you were, you could be a little isolated from that bigger mission, but then you realized the money fed the mission. You know, uh, this was before World Central Kitchen, you know, got that Bezos money and all that other fun stuff. So this was when it was like, hey, the work we're doing here in the restaurants is directly funding his ability to go and do this. Um, and it also inspired us to act more charitably and to give more of ourselves and our time in, in those ways. And so I mean, that part of working for Jose was amazing uh the creativity that just flows out of that dude all day every day i remember i was in paris with him once and we're walking down as we we'd, we'd been up in Montmartre, and we're walking down down that strip and he's smoking a cigar and we're looking at shop windows and we're li we're literally pulling pulling a bottle because paris and and he's smoking a cigar and there's a, a shop that sells only vintage clocks right he's like should open a restaurant deals with time the time we spend at the table what time it takes to cook food to prepare food to grow food we should do something around time and then the next shop is like lingerie and he's like we should do something that's about the sensuality and the sexuality of eating and, and this is like five shops in a row he comes up with five new restaurants probably forgets all of them and then somewhere down the road like three years later you know he's like Remember when we talked about doing a restaurant about time? This is a menu I want to do at mini bar based off that idea. And you're like, uh, I can't believe you remembered that. Uh, okay. So the, the creativity that came out of him all day, every day was at times overwhelming because you'd go working down one path and he'd come in and go like, no, do that instead. Let's go do that. Okay, and so you go do that, and he come back to you six months later and go, well, why didn't you finish that? Yeah. Because you told me to, I don't want to hear what I told you. So we've all uh, worked with those kind of visionaries, right? Who are, yeah. who are, they've got a million ideas and they're amazing ideas. And, and in every sense of the word, it was awesome and terrible all at the same times. Uh, and so that was a, that was a fun, it was a fun time. It was an exhausting time. And it was an exhilarating time. Uh, I mean, it, it's telling that seven years with Jose made me say, 
I'm just going to move to an island in the Pacific now. <laughs> Well, I don't. I, 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 could, I don't think. I don't know how he sustains that energy. I yeah. couldn't do it after after those years. I was just that many years. Yeah, yeah that's, that's pretty amazing. Let's talk about that. So you spent. You spent. So you're from DC. You've spent oh. your entire life in the DC area, oh. and you've just about what a month and two days ago decided to move to the most remote place on earth, which is it's a fact that I learned when I spent a couple a few weeks there, which is Hawaii yeah. is actually the most remote place on the planet. Um, it's 4,000 miles in any direction to hit land that isn't another Hawaiian island. Yeah. It's, it's wild. So talk, talk, what, talk about, like, why, why'd you so do it? What, it's funny, it guests here, as they first started meeting me, and this is a, it's a, it's a private club, and a lot of people just live here full time, uh, and others are here, you know, months at a time. And so they started asking me, you know, why, why did you decide to come and work here? And I said, because they asked me if I would. Um, it was really that there came a point toward the end of time working with Jose and it had been, it, it was, a, there was a bad day, you know, it, we have them. And I was talking to Chelsea and it was, it was a rough day. And she said, you know, are you happy where you are now? I said, I'm not right now. I'm not in a happy place. And she said, you know, what do you, if you could do anything, what would you do? I was like, I would scuba dive all the time. I would get out of this, like the, the intensity of opening restaurants. And she said, well, how old do you want to be when you can scuba dive all the time? And my answer was, I want to be like 10 years ago old. Yeah. And she said, well, okay, we can't do that. She said, but let's just put it out into the world that that is what we want. And we put it out there and we, we've spent a lot of time in the Caribbean. So we thought like, oh, I'll find some little resort on some island down in the Caribbean and we'll, we'll make that work. And then literally this job fell in my lap. I got a call asking if I wanted to interview for it. I did two video interviews. A week later, I flew here. Uh, the two of us flew out here and we took one look around and I looked at her and said, I'm, I'm ready tomorrow. How are you? And look, and it was, it was tough. I mean, we left our families completely behind They're, You know, I call, I call it like eight o'clock in the morning and it's the middle of the afternoon for them. Um, it's, I've never been away from home in that way. Uh, but I also thought, when do you ever get the chance to move to Hawaii? When do you ever get the chance to just change your entire life? Not often. And I, I've lived a, you know, a, a, I feel a very wonderful and adventurous life, but I thought, boy, this is an adventure. Yeah. And uh, thankfully I have a wonderful partner who had my back and said, I'm in, let's, let's see what happens. And yeah, so here we are. It's, it's, it's still all new territory for us. I mean, we literally haven't even unpacked yet, but, um, yeah, you're just but, in yeah. your, you're just in your, in your new place as of just like a week ago. Right? Well, we, we moved in on Tuesday. So Two days ago. Yeah. 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 But as I said, like I got up this morning, walked across the street, jumped in the Pacific ocean and went for a swim for work. Yeah. Okay. So yeah, a lot of it was just more than anything. I just wanted to change my lifestyle. And, it, and if I'm honest about the DC thing, uh, and I, I won't roll politics here, but the last year and a half in DC, it got dark there, like mm -hmm. real dark. And it didn't feel like the place I lived my whole life. It got real. It was just different. Um, and I wanted to reset. I wanted to refresh. And again, when someone says, "Do you want to move to paradise?" You have to say yes. Right. Yeah. <laughs> We well, figured all, if we came out here and didn't love it, we could always go home. But if we didn't come, we'd always regret it. Yeah, I've always felt that way about these kinds of big decisions. Is yeah. you know, there, there of course are, are life things that can get in the way. But when there's a big, amazing opportunity in front of you, the best thing you can do is take that step forward and, and jump into it. And, and absolutely, take it. yeah, that's great. All here right, here I am, and here, here we are talking about box wine. Um, all right, we've got about five minutes left. Uh, nope. My last my last question for you is, because you call yourself the metal sommelier, yeah. and you talked a little bit about how punk rock was your influence for yeah. uh, for uh, for getting into wine. So who's your favorite band? Uh, and if you could see any one band from any time in history, who would it be? Yeah, these are the worst questions, because there's so many. When I mentioned in the bio that I listen to as much Buck Owens as I listen to Slayer, yeah. it's true. Um, you know, so I'm always torn on that stuff because, like, I want to go see Hank Williams in like 1942, 
but I also want to go see The Clash in 1978. But I also want to see Iron Maiden in 82. And I also, you know, I want to fly to Norway and see Enslaved because I've never gotten to see him play a headline except in the United States because yeah. no one cares about Enslaved in the United States. Uh, I will tell you this. If you said right now I could have tickets for anyone, I would always go see Nick Cave in the Bad Seeds. Uh, they are, to me, these, I was, I was on about them last night, but they are like the single greatest, tightest, hottest rock and roll band I've ever had the good fortune of seeing. But, uh, yeah, if you, if you just drop me out there in the world, uh, I'd probably go see The Clash. That's one, that's one I was just not, when, when I was old enough to go to shows, it was already over. Yeah. Yeah, that would be a great show. That would have been a great yeah. show. Uh, someday. I did get to see Joe Strummer a bunch of years ago. Okay. Uh, he, he played at the uh, 930 Club, and that was, that was pretty special, getting to see him perform at all. It was really cool. Well, I've been lucky. I, I've seen everybody. That's great. I, I also have a punk. I don't think I've told you this. I also have a punk rock background. I've played bass in the punk band all through high school. We did the battle nice. of the band. So I'm, I'm right there with you. I love it. And yeah. And you know, and I grew up as a metalhead. My, my sister is a few years older than me, but she looks so much younger than me. Um, but when I was uh, younger, she would take me to see, like we saw Motley Crue and Judas Priest and Iron Maiden and Black Sabbath. We saw every metal band in the eighties. Um, if they had, if they had big hair, we saw them. And uh, so I was really lucky to just go see tons and tons of concerts in my life, which okay. people ask me about moving out here. Aren't you going to miss live music? I was like, eh, I've seen so many. Yeah. Uh, yes, I will miss it, but I'll be okay. I'll go for a swim. It'll be fine. Yeah, and, and yeah, go for a swim and you'll feel better about everything. Yeah. Well, Andy, this has been great. Thank you for coming Thanks, on. Man. I hope everyone who's on here has enjoyed, enjoyed the conversation, enjoyed getting to know Andy a little bit. Um, Jake, it's all, by the way, it's always just, I love talking to you and I love, I love when we get to do anything like this together. Yeah. So super fun. Thanks for, for letting me be a part of this. Definitely. Um, and then the last thing I'll say is anyone who's still on, who's still on, um, uh, many of you have, have, are looking forward to the next box. So use code Andy Myers and you'll get 10% off the next box that you, that you buy. So, um, Yay. So. all right. We didn't get to every question in the comments and there's a few others, um, but uh, hopefully everybody enjoyed this and, you know, if anyone has questions, we're still a young brand. There's, you know, I'm still looking at most of the emails and the conversations and the questions that come in. We do have a couple other people involved, but, uh, I'm still seeing pretty much everything. So if you have questions, feedback, thoughts, we're here, this is, we're, we're trying to build this. And, you know, if we, if we can't put great wine into this box, the whole thing falls apart. Right. And so our vision is to keep making wine that's varietally correct from high end regions around the world, working with directly with amazing producers or buying grapes and producing ourselves with a weight with amazing winemakers. So that that's our Eventually vision. going to get you to make a German Riesling. Just saying. And then, yeah, one day we'll make a German Riesling. I know okay. I'll be, and I'll be there when you do. Yep. Yep. You'll probably, you'll probably tell it, send the producer our way and say, you need this. This is this the guy. one. Jake, this, guy, this is yeah. the one, do it, uh, or I'm out. <laughs> do it or I'm out. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, because ultimatums work well. Yeah, that ultimatum, right? Cool. Yeah. All right, Andy, enjoy the sun. Enjoy your time there, and uh, we'll talk Will soon. Do. I'll talk to you soon, Jake. Hope you come visit soon. And bye, Thanks. everybody. Have a great day. Bye-bye.